Well, I've titled this week's sermon, Undervalued. One of the cries that we often hear in life is, that's not fair. You hear it so often, don't you, with young children, you hear it on the playground when they're playing a game, or you hear it on the sidelines or a football pitch when one child gets much play time than another, and the other one has to sit on the bench or something. You hear it in the classroom when one child gets a good grade and another one not so good. These kind of objections are not reserved just for school, are they? As adults, we find ourselves complaining that life just isn't fair. <coughs> Excuse me. It might be that someone gets promoted over you uh, at work or gets more pay for doing the same work. Or that one person's left a large inheritance and his brother isn't. One believer seems to be granted one blessing after another, while someone else seems to have one trial after another. One child's given lots of financial support for school or college, another receives absolutely nothing. One person's mate dies of cancer, while another's healed. One person's faithful, faithful, faithful work is honoured, while the faithful work of another just seems to do nothing. I bet you can add your own items to the list. These are just things that have come into my head. There are times in life when we all have, on occasion, I'm sure, said that things just weren't fair. They just don't feel fair. There's times when we feel that we're getting cheated. Consequently, when we come to Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, it's so easy for us to identify with those who've received less to such a great degree that we are blinded to the message of the parable. I won't read the old story again, but immediately as we read it, we see the problem here. Some of the people worked 12 hours and some worked only one, and all of them received the same amount of money at the end of the day. And just imagine how you feel. Suppose you agreed for, say, £5 an hour. You work for 12 hours and so you've made £60. You suppose someone else, uh, and the, but then suppose that someone else was hired later and made the same amount. How would you feel about that? Now that some of the people were making £6.66 an hour, others were making £10 an hour, some were making £20 an hour, and one group was actually being paid £60 for one hour's work, all for doing the same work, but less hours. This parable irritates us so much that many people have tried to explain this parable away by saying the people who went into work at the beginning of the day were lazy, or people who worked the hour worked as hard as the others who'd been there all day. But this is unsupported by anything in the text. The Bible, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about that. It's unlikely. The owner in the parable says nothing about the work ethic of the people. We're led to believe that all these men worked faithfully. Others just like try to say that the message of the parable is that it doesn't matter how much or how little we do, we'll all receive the same thing. And in one sense, that's true. Everyone who has faith in Christ will receive eternal life. But there are many places in Scripture where we're told that God will also additionally reward each person for their labour. The challenge this morning is to face this text squarely and seek to understand what the Lord would have us learn from it. And I'm hoping that we see four lessons at least in the text this week. First of all, the kingdom of heaven is characterised by grace. The first thing that we notice is what Jesus tells us the parable is about. He begins the parable with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like. This parable is not teaching us about good business practice or, or labour law. It's designed to teach us about God's kingdom and how people get to heaven. First, we should learn that God is seeking people for his kingdom, 
Not only does God seek them, but he continues to seek them for inhabitants of his kingdom. God has sought people since creation and he continues to seek them today. God seeks you diligently. He's pursued you in your early years. And if you did not respond, he continues to seek you in your teenage years and in your adult years. And yes, even in your twilight years, God wants you in his kingdom. He wants to be in a relationship and friends with you forever. Second, we must learn that all who accept God's invitation of grace will receive eternal life in heaven. It doesn't matter whether you turn to the Saviour. The same wonderful gift of salvation will be given to anyone who comes to him. He will not cast away, we're told in Acts 2.21 and Romans 10.13 and other places. As long as there is life in your body, there is still time. I love the fact that the guys who work for only one hour waited in the marketplace all day long. They were willing to work if only for one hour. They could have gone home. They could have given up. They could have concluded that they were worthless, but they didn't. They waited in hope and their hope was rewarded. You may feel that there is too much water under the bridge for you. You may feel that you squandered too many opportunities. Friend, don't turn away. The Saviour continues to invite you to be part of his kingdom. There is still hope for you to find forgiveness and everlasting life. It's never too late. Receive that offer today. Secondly, I hope we see that there's a great benefit in coming early. Many will look at this parable and conclude that they can wait until the last minute to receive Christ. Or wait till I'm on my deathbed. They'll say that they can receive the benefit without having to work at it. Without needing to be a disciple for so many years. Why get paid £60 and the £60 an hour rather than £5 an hour? I mean... It makes sense, doesn't it? Why not wait to follow Jesus? After all, if the last will be first and the first last, why not try to be last? And then now we can, then we can become first in heaven. Suppose God bless you though, with a couple of healthy children. <clears throat> After several years, you decide that you'd like to adopt another child. So you find a two-year-old in need of a home and, and adopt this child into your family. The experience is so delightful for you that you find another child. This one's eight years old and you make him part of your family. Then you go out one more time and you go out this time and find a 13 year old without a home and you adopt her into your family. Every one of these children is part of the same family. Everyone is loved fully by the parents. I suppose we'd not be surprised if the two biological children felt a little bit of resentment over the division of their parents' love. They may have resented the invasion of their territory. But do you think those biological children would have wanted to trade places with their adopted brothers and sisters? I don't think so. And I believe that every one of the adopted children would have jumped for joy to have had the opportunity to be born into this household. They would love to be able to look at their baby pictures. They'd love to remember the times when their parents held them in their arms, when they played with them, when they cared for them. They'd have loved to share in, in the family history. They would have been glad to have been spared the scars of rejection that they faced and other problems that remain long after they've been adopted. It's a wrong assumption to think that delaying our commitment to Christ is better. What makes us think that living without God is better than enjoying the fellowship of his presence every day, every minute of every day? We seem to think that we need 
to sow wild oats while we can. We seem to feel that we'll be cheated if we don't get to indulge in the sins that others get up to. We, we seem to... Why shouldn't we rather say, I must not delay in running to the Saviour? I don't want to miss a single day or a moment of being with him. Those who come late, who will enjoy the kingdom of heaven, just like those who come early. But those who come early have the blessing of enjoying God's grace for longer periods of time, for every minute of their life with Christ. They have less regrets and sorrow as they look back on their lives. Talk to any person who's been a true follower of Christ for a number of years, and none of them will say, Oh, I wish I'd waited longer before I trusted Jesus. None of us will. Instead, we'll say, I wish I'd have become a Christian earlier. For me, I became a Christian in my 30s. I wish I'd have been in, as a child. The third thing I think we should notice from this passage is God cares for people more than things. We look at this parable often in the wrong way. We see God acting unjustly towards those who've worked all day. But in truth, there's no injustice here. The owner agreed a contract with these workers. They agreed a contract and agreed that it was fair and just. That fact doesn't change because the others received a different wage. We see this, don't we, in professional sports frequently. A footballer demands a, a long-term contract so they might have the security for the future. And three years into, say, a six-year contract, they're complaining because others are getting paid more than they are. They feel that the owners no longer respect them. But is the owner being unfair? Of course not. The owner and the player negotiated a fair and good contract and the owner is living by his end of the deal. But stop looking at the one who's whining. Look at the mercy that was extended to those who work less time. As I understand it, a denarius is a day's wage. And the men who worked as day labourers, well, they live from day to day. Anything less than a denarius had put them in some dire straits. Families had go hungry. Sure, these men did not work as long. They didn't really deserve a denarius. But the owners are aware of their needs. Determined to meet their needs with, without regard for what his obligation was, the owner would have been just in giving these people much smaller amounts of money. But instead of acting in justice, he acted in mercy. Let me say that again. Instead of acting in justice, he acted with mercy. In your sense of outrage at the perceived inequity of, of this pair, have you missed the element of mercy and grace? Do you really want God to treat you with justice? Do you want God to only give you what you deserve? Of course not. If we got what we deserve, we'll see what we deserve by seeing the punishment Jesus took on the cross. That's what we deserve. It's vital that we depend on God's grace and his mercy. We depend on God's mercy and it's vital for our own salvation and life. And it seems to me that this is the main message of the story. We are recipients of mercy. Beggars can't be choosers. Now I'd like us to notice from this passage that when we focus on what others get, we're unable to enjoy what we've been given. The most practical lesson for you and, and for me to notice is the attitude of the people who riot first. These men did not feel cheated when they thought they were going to receive a denarius. In fact, we might imagine that they felt very fortunate to have a job. They looked forward to bringing home a good day's wage for the family. If they'd been paid first instead of last, these men 
wouldn't have grumbled at all unless they talked to their friends on the street afterwards. There's another Jewish parable that both parallels and kind of illuminate Jesus' story. And it's helped to clarify my understanding of this psalm, uh, this parable greatly. It says, there's this one about a farmer who lived in Poland. For generations before him, his family had been very poor. One night he was awakened by an angel of the Lord who said, You have found favour in the eyes of your maker. He wants to do for you what he did for your ancestor Abraham. He wants to bless you. Therefore, make any three requests that you will of God, and he will be pleased to give you He'll give them to you. There is only one condition. Your neighbour will get a double portion of everything that is bequeathed to you. Well, the farmer was startled by the revelation and woke up his wife to tell her about it. She suggested that they put the old thing to the test. So they prayed, Oh, blessed God, if we could just have a herd of a thousand cattle, that will enable us to break out of poverty into which we've lived for generations. That'd be wonderful. No sooner had they said these words than they heard the sound of animal noises outside. Lo and behold, all around the house were, were a thousand magnificent animals. During the next two days, the farmer's feet hardly touched the ground. He divided his time between praising God for such a great generosity and beginning to make practical provisions for his newly acquired affluence. On the third afternoon, he was up on a hill behind his house trying to decide where to build a new barn, when he looked across at his neighbour's field. There, standing on the green hillside, were 2,000 magnificent cattle. For the first time since the angel of the Lord had appeared, the joy within him evaporated and a scowl of envy took its place. When he went home that evening in a foul mood, he refused to eat supper and went to bed in an absolute rage. He couldn't fall asleep because every time he closed his eyes, all he could see was his neighbour's 2,000 cattle. Deep in the night, however, he remembered that the angel had said that he could make three wishes. With that, he shifted his focus away from his neighbour and back to his own situation. And the old joy quickly returned to him, digging deep into his own heart to find out what else he really wanted. He began to realise that in addition, in addition to some kind of material security, he'd always wanted descendants to carry on his name into the future. So he prayed a second time, Gracious God, if it pleases thee, give me a child that I may have descendants. With that, he and his wife made love. And because of his experience with the cattle, he wasn't that surprised to short, shortly thereafter to learn that his wife was expecting a baby. The next months were passed in unbroken joy. The farmer was busy assimilating his newly acquired affluence and looking after and looking forward to the great grace of becoming a parent. On the night his first child was born, he was absolutely overjoyed. The next day was the Sabbath, and he went to the synagogue, and at the time of prayers of the people, he stood up and shared with the gathered community his great good fortune. Now at last the child had been born into their home. He'd hardly sat down, however, when his neighbour got up and said, God has indeed been gracious to our little community. I had twin sons born last night. Thanks be to God. On hearing that, the farmer went home in an utterly different mood than the one in which he came. Instead of being joyful once again, he was filled with the canker of jealousy. This time, however, his envy did not abate. Late that evening, he made his third request of God. Please, please gouge out my right eye. No sooner had he said these words and the angel who had initiated the old process appeared again and asked, 
Why, son of Abraham, have you turned to such a vengeful desirings? With pent-up rage, the father replied, I cannot stand to see my neighbour prosper. I'll gladly sacrifice half of my vision for the satisfaction of knowing that he'll never be able to look on what he has. Those words were followed by a long silence. And as the farmer looked, he saw tears forming in the eyes of the angel. Why, O son of Abraham, have you turned an occasion for blessing into a time of hurting? Your third request will not be granted. Not because the Lord lacks integrity, but because God is full of mercy. However, know this, O foolish one. You have brought sadness not only on yourself, but to the very heart of God. This is in John Claypool's Stories Jesus Tells book. The point is clear. As long as we're focused on what the other guy has got and what we don't have, we'll be unable to enjoy what God's given us. We must abandon this notion that we deserve what everyone else has been given. Keep it up with the Joneses, we call it, don't we? You expect this kind of behaviour from children, but we're not children anymore. May I give you a couple of practical ways to apply this parable to your life? Take advantage of the offer of salvation. Don't delay in getting right with God. If you've never surrendered your life and your confidence for salvation to Jesus Christ, do so today. You need to give your life to Jesus and you will be saved today. Take a good look at what God has given you. Ponder the wonder of eternal life. Ponder the cost of forgiveness and your undeserved grace. Spend much time considering what you compared with and what you really deserve. Do you battle against the consumptive mentality of our day? Focus on what you have rather than what you don't have. Work on learning how to celebrate the good fortunes of others. Just like that story, he should be celebrating his neighbour's good fortune and God's good gifts to him. Join in the celebration rather than reigning on the parade. Life is not always fair. But God is always good. Which of these truths you focus on will determine whether you live your life feeling deprived or in knowing that you're truly blessed? Well, let's pray and then let's sing. But let's pray first. Loving Father God, we just thank you for them reminders. Uh, forgive us when we're looking at what others have and being jealous of that and wishing we had more and more instead of being thankful for the good gifts that you give us, even the very breath that we breathe. Thank you that you don't treat us as we deserve. Lord, we deserve your punishment, your just punishment. But instead of justice, we get mercy. We thank you that your justice was meted out on your son Jesus as he died on the cross for our sins, not his own. But we thank you that you rose him to life again and thank you that we have that same resurrection hope for ourselves. Lord, we thank you that though we don't deserve it, we thank you that in your goodness you give us everlasting life. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's harvest. We're celebrating God's good gifts to us. And there's nothing more than the good gift of his giving of his one and only son. We're going to listen to a piece of music now. Uh, it's a hymn we'll all know probably. When I survey the wondrous cross. And this is just such a lovely version of it. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 